This is the Your Career Story Podcast, and you're listening to episode 61, Overcoming Imposter Syndrome at Work, on-air coaching. Welcome to Your Career Story Podcast, a show that's designed for rock star professionals looking for that extra booster shot of confidence in their careers. Whether you're trying to get clarity on a job transition, want some work-life balance inspiration, or need a strategy to snag that promotion or raise, this podcast is for you. I'm your host, Jenna Viviano, ex-Wall Streeter turned startup junkie who now coaches hundreds of clients, empowering them to take back control of the job search and land their dream job. So sit back, grab a glass of wine, and prepare yourself for your weekly boost of career confidence. friends, and welcome back to another episode of the Your Career Story podcast. We are doing something a little bit different today. I've never done this on the podcast, but I basically wanted to give you a little bit of a behind the scenes of what does coaching and career coaching look like? <laughs> um, I get a lot of questions from people like, what do you do in a session? How does it actually work? And I actually had this individual um, reach out to me via email and ask if I would do an on-air coaching. So she volunteered herself to do this. She's amazing. And today what we talk about is really about overcoming imposter syndrome. She's starting a new job and she's dealing with something that I know a lot of women deal with. I've seen women from um, whether they are starting out in their career, mid in their career, or literally if they're senior level, close to CEO level, all women deal with some variation of imposter syndrome. So I thought this was a really great conversation. My hope for you is for you to understand a little bit about one, that you're not alone with the imposter syndrome, and two, just to hear a little bit about where your story may align with this woman's story. Um, This was a really fun episode for me to record, and I got to show you a little bit about how coaching works and how we actually get to a resolution and create some solutions for people. And if you are ever interested in coaching, you know where we are, jennaviviano.com slash apply to be a part of a Recruit the Employer program. But here is a sneak peek on how we do coaching. Awesome. Well, welcome today, guys. Welcome to another episode of the Your Career Story podcast. I'm so excited to have my guest on today, Samia, where we're going to be actually doing an on-air coaching call. And um, she kind of approached me. She's an awesome (laughs) self-starter. She proactively reached out to me. And um, I would love to just kind of walk you through of what the career coaching process looks like. So why don't we get started? Samia, why don't you give give me a little bit of an update of what's going on with you right now in your career? Thanks so much for having me on your podcast, by the way. (laughs) You're Uh, welcome. (laughs) uh, So what's going on with me? I think when I reached out to you, it was, I started a new job on Monday and I was reaching out because something that I've struggled with in past jobs um, has been this feeling of imposter syndrome or feeling Mm -hmm. not good enough or really just holding myself back or kind of self-sabotaging or a mix of all of those things. And I'm sure there's been good things, like great highlights in my career. I'm, I have a master's in public health, and I've been working in health advocacy for the last four years. So I've had a lot of awesome experiences, but I think I just feel like I'm floating from thing to thing to thing and only staying for like a year and a half and not really finding my place where I can really invest and grow. And I kind of feel like this feeling of imposter syndrome has stopped me short a lot of the time. So I reached out because I just wanted to, you know, take a gut check. I, I, I need some sort of like mentorship right now. Yeah. So tell me where, where, when you define imposter syndrome, what does that mean to you? And where do you feel like it shows up the most? I, I just get this feeling like, uh, like when I get a big deliverable or an assignment or when it's up to me to take leadership, I tend to freeze up, especially because I work in communications. Writing is so subjective that I often get really, like if I get negative feedback, that's something that really sticks to my core. And instead of thinking about that negative feedback and just being like, oh, okay, here's how I can make these edits or think about doing this differently next time. Or it, I internalize it, I think in a really unhelpful way. And I don't really progress from the feedback. I feel like I have to have things delivered. I've had some good supervisors who have kind of like, we've built like a special understanding, but, um, Oftentimes, if you have a really busy supervisor who isn't like there to invest in you, it can just be hard. I I think I have a lot of like insecurity mm. uh, around my work, and it tends to show. I thought it was something that I knew it was something I had a bit like socially, but I didn't realize it was the kind of thing that could permeate into your work. And I think I just want to feel 
confident in my ability. I mean, I, I get the job often. It's strange because during the job app process, it's which is most I'm people's issues, up. right? <laughs> I know. I know. I don't get the job. It's the sustaining process that feels yeah. a little bit more difficult for you. Where do yes. you think that stems from? Like where, if you could take a pinpoint in your career, and I'm happy to give an example for me when I really felt like my confidence was totally kaput. Um, when I used to work in investment banking, I can pretty much pinpoint the exact moment where I was like, am I even good at anything? Does even, am I, what do I even deserve to be here? Did they just hire me? Cause I'm a female and they want to hit their diversity numbers. Like I literally had all those thoughts that went into my brain. That sounds so familiar. Yes. Right. And so I hit this point where I was like, it was a toxic culture that I was in, first of all. So there, that is a component to it, perhaps um, in the interview process for you of really understanding who is your supervisor, who is your manager, is it a good fit, mutual fit for you? So a lot of people in their career will interview and they'll feel like they're on a performance, which is what you do actually really well. Yeah. <laughs> Surprisingly, <laughs> usually if people have imposter syndrome, they're not very good at the interview process, but I'm happy to report that that's not the case for you. <laughs> um, but what I, what I typically find is that there is this kind of thing that holds them back from mm-hmm. actually like putting their best self forward for fear of rejection, for fear of being looked at as not good enough and women struggle with it the most. So I can totally understand that sentiment. I've experienced it myself. Um, how do you typically, like if you do get bad feedback, right? When you are in a new position, what typically happens in your brain? Oh, I feel like I revert back to this like childlike state, but like mm. it, to go back to like what you said about like, can you pinpoint the moment? I think I got off to like a rocky start professionally, which happens to a lot of people. I mean, like you're like a new person in the world and I'm 27. So I think I'm hitting like mid not even mid-career. Like I'm still very early career. But after I graduated from my master's- You have enough experience to know what's working and what's not working or to feel like something's not working. Yeah. Exactly. I have enough experience to know that I need to like pivot my strategy a little bit in what I'm doing and that it's the problem is probably me too, as well as some environments. But when I first got out of my master's program and I got a job at a comms firm in New York, it was really fast paced. No one was really around to train me. I felt like the environment was just not a good fit, but I didn't have any other like full-time work experience outside Mm -hmm. of that. So I didn't know whether it was me or them. It was hard to gauge. And I think it just made my confidence plummet because I was let go after like eight months and I just really couldn't grasp the pace or the company culture or um, a lot of my first deliverables, um, like first op-eds or talking points, just like the writing wasn't up to par and I just felt like I wasn't picking things up fast enough. So I think that experience, if I could pinpoint it's kind of stuck with me as I've moved from experience to experience. And like, I never expected to get let go for my abilities when I was graduating college or my master's Art. program. I was always really good at school. So, and I was always told like, oh, you're a good writer. You're um, like, I got good grades. And so making shock to the system, like, it was a shock to the system. And I think I never fully processed that as I moved on professionally. And I kind of feel like in my next roles, while things got better and I never got let go again, I always kind of had the fear in the back of my head. Yeah. You were yeah. over, over, almost overcompensating. So you have let this one experience define your career. Yeah. It was, that was a blip on the radar. So here's what I can tell you. I was not good at finance. <laughs> I was terrible at finance. <laughs> I probably actually, I would say never say deserve to be, um, talk down to or any of those kind of things. That's not what I'm saying here, but I do think that I wasn't probably the best person in that specific position at that specific job. So when I'm thinking about confidence, right. And thinking about imposter syndrome and thinking about that own experience in my life, I had to make a decision in that collaborative environment. I had to decide I was going to be a part, really take a pay careful attention to the culture of the company that I was going to be in, in, and then also allow my time to myself time to heal. So I say this all the time to clients that like work is not transactional. It is very much emotional. And so all those fears that you're talking about, there's going to be hundreds of women that are going to be listening to this and they're like, yes, I so relate to what you're saying. So one, you're not alone in that. I think the second piece of the puzzle is you have to allow yourself the time to process that. And you have to also be able to make a decision in and cut into the ground of being like, this is not going to define me, define me rather. There is a before and an after, and I have to choose my moment of like, I'm actually good at what I've been able to do. I'm actually good at what I've been able to accomplish thus far. I will continue to do good things for myself and for my future. And this does not have to define my experience. But I know that when you get let go, you can feel like, well, maybe I'm not good at these things. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
yeah. there's this feeling of, of perhaps I'm not actually as good as I thought that I was. And perhaps they're actually affirming all of my worst fears are now coming true. Let me tell you the truth that that is not true of you. So why don't you tell me what you've, because here's the deal is if you do keep believing that it is going to trail with you for the rest of your career and you're never going to be able to move up and you're just going to hop and hop and hop and you're just, your nervousness is going to take over you and you're going to be all stuck in your head instead of producing really great quality work. That's exactly what's happening. Even as I've kind of moved up from org laterally and my salary has grown a bit, like it, it is what's happening and I can tell I'm holding myself back. So can you tell me one or two things that you feel like you're really good at when it comes to work? Oh gosh. Um, this is actually harder than, <laughs> than I think. I think I'm, I think I'm really creative. I think that was always like a strength of mine growing up. As, as when I, I first realized I was good at writing, um, because we get these prompts in like third grade and we'd get like a set time to write something. And I remember my teacher being like, wow, you write like three pages when like other kids are still stuck on like the first mm-hmm. one. And then from there, I kind of really invested in some humanities courses. And I, I really loved like the content of what I was writing about. So I, I know I'm a good writer and I know I'm creative. Um, I know I have a lot of ideas and that I want to share them with the world and with people and writing is a great way to express that. So I think that in terms of skill set, like I'm, I'm doing what I feel like I'm meant to be doing. And then another strength I feel like might be I think I'm a decent team player. Uh, I don't really have like a competitive spirit, which I think could help me to have a little bit more of a competitive spirit. But I think when people ask for help, uh, I've always been willing to help and, and put in like the extra time or the energy to give somebody on another team, like something that they need or or make a change to a graphic or an edit. Like, I, I think I've never really like made anyone feel bad for asking me for help or made or put anyone off. Like I, I do think that's good about me is that I can be a team player. Yeah. So you just named two things right now. So first of all, the first one that you mentioned is what I often tell people, that's your purest form, right? Like when you were a kid, when you didn't have to, you didn't worry as much about the insecurities, you didn't feel, you didn't have those inhibitions, right? I, I always tell people, look back to when your youngest self and what did you love doing before someone told you you shouldn't do it? <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. And where did you get praised as a young child? So for me, I, when I look back on my life, I was never praised in math class. <laughs> like that was never, you know, I was always creating something. I was building literally, you guys are going to laugh when you hear this all in the podcast and you specifically too. Cause I know you listen to a lot of episodes. Mm-hmm. I used to have my own talk show in my home. <laughs> Like I created my own scripting. I wanted to be Oprah. I mean, my sister be the male guest. Like, I mean, it was just like a whole thing, right? So my youngest pure <laughs> self was always creating something. So of course it makes sense that I was just, it, it, I was having imposter syndrome in a finance role because I wasn't meant to do finance. So I think you first need to ask yourself the question, is it truly that I, the reason why I'm having imposter syndrome because it, I'm not designed for this line of work or is it that somebody has told me that I'm not good enough or I'm not capable or something like that? You have to differentiate between the two. And if it's the latter, I think what you need to really realize is like those people do not define your life. If I had, if I stopped doing what I was doing and really questioned myself more than 24 hours based off of what other people's opinions were, you would not be talking to me right now. Yeah. When you put it like that, and that, that makes sense. You are letting them keep you stuck. Yeah. By, yeah. by letting them have a talk track, they're, they are, they are living rent free in your brain. That's what's happening yeah. right now. You are letting them live rent free in your brain. You are gifted. You are talented. You're utilizing your gifts in your workplace. Now, your job just right now is just to step into that a little bit farther, to lean into that, to have thoughts, to have opinions, and to not be scared about what other people's opinions are. Now, does that mean that we need to go to the other end of the spectrum and shove everybody, like ourselves in everybody's faces? That's not what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. But for most of my women, this is a huge, huge issue of actually identifying what our strengths are and owning them and not apologizing for them. I have so many women that will say, well, I, this is a hard question because I don't know. I'm humble. I'm not, I don't really want to say what the thing is. And I was just talking to a male client yesterday. He's a resume client and he's just, and I loved him for it. He was an awesome client. He was wonderful, but he just was like, yeah, I'm really good at this. I'm really good at this. I'm really good at this. I'm like, gosh, I wish my women would talk like this. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so I first want you to really reflect on um, your experience and the things that you're doing well first before you think about the things that you're not doing well. Do you keep a journal for work? 
I don't keep a journal for work. I, I journal like in my life or just like I write down yeah. notes, but I think it's helpful to have like a strategy on how to journal too. Cause then often I find I'm like just complaining into my journal sure. or writing all my fears, which I don't know how productive that that is at the end of the day. It's not productive. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. Yes. So I think, so a couple of suggestions. We're actually in the process of building out a journal for work because I, I realize that this conversation happens more often than not. And you need a space that's structured to help you process through that. So first thing I want you to start doing is I want you to create maybe um, a notebook or something that you want to, to write this stuff down and, and to write down three work wins for the week. Okay. And then I want you to write down one failure because here's what I want you to get used to doing. I want you to get used to reaffirming the things that you're really good at and celebrating the failure versus looking at the failure as something that's negative. So when you write down the failure, I want you to write the failure down and say what you learned from it. Mm. That practice is so monumental. The reason why I talk about the failure piece is because I think so many women are risk averse and are worried, spends all their time worrying that they're not actually producing anything. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's, and so that's we keep, so we keep ourselves stuck. So how do you relate to that? What, what does, does that make sense for you? Yeah, that makes sense. I think I tend to let the one failure, like when it does happen, really overshadow maybe all of the things that I had done mm-hmm. right. And I think when oftentimes at work, you're not going to get like positive feedback all the time, but if you do something right, people just won't say anything like you're doing your job. Right. So I think I'm somebody that has trouble gauging my performance unless I'm getting positive feedback as well as negative Mm -hmm. feedback. Like, but I can't always control that. So maybe like, I guess what you're saying is that by doing this exercise, that's a way that I can control some of that. Yeah. And I think it's also showing the balance, right? Like three work wins to one failure is pretty darn good. And then over time, you're going to see those work wins compounded over time. The other thing that is kind of fun Um, to think about, or I want you to lavish upon yourself all the nice adjectives that you would use to describe yourself. It doesn't have to be even work-related because here's the reality. It feels so, you're like, you're looking at me. He's like, I'm so uncomfortable. (laughs) Um, And it's not the self-serving type of thing. That's not what I'm aiming. I don't want you to come to create a bunch of vain women. Like that's not my goal with this. My goal is for you to identify matter-of-factly the capabilities and strengths that you have. So you can lean into that and stop worrying about whether you have them or not. You can own it and be like, yeah, that's what I'm good at. Yep. That's what I'm good at. Yeah. That's what I'm good at. I'm really good at that. I'm writing is my thing. It's been my thing since I was in third grade. It's my thing. Yeah. (laughs) Would you allow yourself to do that? Does that feel uncomfortable? Why does that feel uncomfortable? It it does. I guess, I guess it does. I, I don't know. Um, like, like all the positive, positive adjectives about myself. Gosh, Mm -hmm. I like, I have a hard time even like knowing where to start. I I usually tend towards saying like, Oh, I'm creative or I'm smart. I don't know. Those are two things that I I feel like I know about myself. I want you to go 10 deep. I want you to journal through that too. 10 deep to go through right now. No, you don't have to do it right now. You don't have to do it right now. But here's the thing is you probably are talk tracking so many more negative things to yourself than you are positive things. Yeah. And I used to do this too. I used to have a um, a really bad relationship with food. Um, I've talked about this publicly before. I had an eating disorder. It was not a pleasant time in my life. It very much ironically coincided with my investment banking time, which I don't think is a, a mistake there that makes sense that those two things were connected. And what I realized, I finally come to the, came to this realization was if I talked to myself the way that I, if I would talk the way that I talked to myself, if I talked to a, a, my daughter like that or my future daughter like that, I mean, she'd be wrecked for life, <laughs> like totally wrecked for life. Like she would be crawling up in a hole. She wouldn't think she was worthy of anything. And so I, I actually, this is going to be, everyone's going to laugh, but I named my, my body. I named her Vivian because that's what I want to name my daughter one day, hopefully, God willing. And I, anytime I would find myself like berating myself for maybe eating too much or not exercising that day or not running the full three miles and just like beating myself up, I would remind myself and say like, would you tell Vivian that? Would you just like totally berate her? And the reality is, is I would have to check myself and say, no, I wouldn't do that. So I wonder for you, you don't have to name your body, but maybe you just like think about your future, you know, child that you would have. Would you say those things to her or him? And if not, then you shouldn't be saying them to yourself. Yeah, definitely not. I, I wouldn't say those things <laughs> to myself as a kid or no, no, definitely not. And, but it's hard to even like realize what my internal monologue is at work. Mm-hmm. I think um, I've gotten like entrenched in some reactions or just like 
I've been trying to figure out like what some of my triggers are, especially as I'm about to start a new job. Mm-hmm. Uh, and negative feedback tends to be one that I what typically happens when you get negative feedback. Yeah. So if like, for example, if I send in a draft of something that I've written, mm-hmm. um, which is usually the deliverable that I have to present. So I've sent in a draft of an article or of an op-ed or something. And if I get a response from a supervisor, that's like, you know, see my edits and close. I had a supervisor at my last job who I think he was just brutal at delivering feedback um, because, <laughs> because I'd get, I, I would talk to my other colleagues and this is something else that I want to know about, but like, it's a bit of a digression, which is like, you know, at what point is, uh, talking with colleagues, like bordering on like toxic negativity. And, yeah. We can definitely like, talk about that. Yeah. But, um, so I talked to them and I hear that they get similar reactions. So everyone would be like, Oh, it's not you. It's not just you. But just seeing feedback that's like, this was like shoddily written or sloppy, or especially if I knew that I had procrastinated slightly on something that I had mm-hmm. turned in, I'd be like, oh man, I did it again. If I had only just spent a little longer, if I had caught that typo before it went to them, like I just look careless. I don't want them to think that I'm careless. I think my brain starts going into a spiral about how I come off to that person or how I come off to my supervisor and how they're going to think that I'm careless or bad at my job or that they made the wrong hire, that they regret hiring me. Mm. A lot of that. You are so honest and brave right now. I so appreciate you for sharing (laughs) this because I bet you any money that's in, you actually probably are more aware of your internal monologue than you realize. Oh, really? Is that a monologue? I don't know how to stop it. <laughs> no, here's the thing is that monologue is very common, but I wonder what would happen if you were able to reframe that, that energy that you're putting towards wondering what they're going to think about you instead of worrying, because worrying is like unfocused prayers. <laughs> it's basically yeah. what worrying is, right? So worrying is unfocused prayer. Somebody told me that. I can't take credit for that phrase. But I wonder if you, you channel that energy towards instead like thinking about an action plan of how to get a hair bigger, a hair better next time. So not even that you have to totally overhaul your process and put so much pressure on yourself to get it perfect. Cause that's not going to be helpful either. You're not going to make other mistakes that you wouldn't have made before. So let's talk a little bit about the procrastination piece. So you had mentioned this before. Why tell me about like the process of, cause you, I think you, you're sharing some ownership in that, right? Like you could be mm-hmm. doing better. Why do you feel like there's a procrastination going on? It's when I I almost wonder, like I've been doing a little like self-reading and Mm self-help type thing. Like, I almost wonder if it's that I'm afraid of doing, like if there's a part of me that's also just like afraid of succeeding. Okay. Tell me why, why is that? Um, I actually have never understood that personally. It's one of those things where like, I try to understand when clients say that, but I think that's because I'm, and if you guys are familiar with Enneagram three, if you're familiar with Enneagram, I'm Enneagram three. So I'm like, okay, I'm so success minded, which is interesting that you're a four though. We should discuss that. So I'm so success minded. I'm like, I'm never worried about becoming successful. (laughs) I'm like, (laughs) I'm successful. So walk me through that mental process. Well, I thought, so when I first took the Enneagram, I was a three as well. And I thought that's how I was too, because I, I, get, I tend to get very focused on work and I, I do put a lot of energy and time and effort into my work. But I think the, the procrastination aspect, it's a weird mix of things. Like, I think I got so used to a zone where I was fighting for approval or mm-hmm. that that's almost what feels comfortable now. And mm-hmm. it's like my my brain or body keeps returning to that zone, Mm. even when I don't want it to. It's like I sabotage myself because that's what I know. And that's what's comfortable. And I think I need to like step out and do what's uncomfortable, which might just be doing a good job or starting something early or I I don't know that that's the type of thing that I'm like, it just feels like a complicated not to like, a not, I don't know how to describe it. Yeah. So I I can relate to that a little bit. So I can think about a lot of times in my business where I have had, I'm fearing it's for me, it manifests more in fearing failure. Um, Mm -hmm. but it also simultaneously very much connected to success, right? So like I've avoided launching recruit the employer in a course format for two years now (laughs) (laughs) because I'm fearing doing the work that I'm wasting time on it. Cause I know the outcome's going to be X, Y, Z, because I have these unrealistic expectations that I feel like I've learned before that, you know, it's not going to turn out how you want it to turn out. It's probably going to fail. You're not going to get as much as you versus just going into it open, 
open hands and being like, no, I'm going to go for this. I'm going to put my all into this thing. I'm going to do the steps to get the thing done and not procrastinate because I also am a procrastinator. I think it comes down to like, does this feel really hard for me to finish? Let me guess. If you're listening to this podcast, you're probably not looking for any job. You're looking for the right job. And the right job is not at your current company. You're tired of feeling underpaid, overworked, and like your career is in the hands of the employer. You're ready to make some moves, but you're overwhelmed by all of the options. You don't know how to sell yourself, and you have a nagging feeling that your lack of confidence is keeping you from success, not to mention negotiating the amount you're worth. If this sounds like you and you're a mid to senior level career woman who makes over $100,000, we have the four-step solution just for you. Our signature program, Recruit the Employer, is designed to help women leaders get clarity on what they want to do, market to their dream jobs, and negotiate thousands more. Using a personal branded approach, we equip you with the tools to sell yourself in a non-sleazy way, think like a C-suite leader, and ultimately take back control of your career. To apply, head on over to www.genevaviano.com slash apply. Over the course of 12 weeks, you'll network with other female leaders at similar stages, learn how to double your salary, and solidify your career story. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention, the dreaded resume and LinkedIn profile? Yeah, we do that for you. Because of the intimate nature of this program and limited spots, we are very selective about who we invite into the program. To see if you'd be a good fit, again, head on over to www.genaviviano.com slash apply to apply to recruit the employer today. We can't wait to support you. All right, back to the episode. If it feels really hard for you to finish, it's probably why you're procrastinating because you're worried you're already anticipating a negative outcome when you're starting the process. Pretty much, yeah. (laughs) And so I wonder if when you feel that tension rising where you're like, I'm procrastinating, I'm procrastinating because I don't want to do it, You instead reframe your brain to say, what if I'm going to have a really great outcome on this? Or actually even going so far as to say that affirmation, I'm going to have a great outcome on this. This is going to get me rising like A plus. Mm. So it's like, it's like speaking into existence. What is in the future? People think that's a bunch of woo woo. I disagree. That's how I met my future husband, Brett. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and Jesus, both of those things combined. But I, I spoke it as if it was already happening, at, even though I had so many proof points in the past to prove that I was going to be single forever because nothing had worked out in the past, right? Mm-hmm. So the same thing holds true in this instance. If you feel like you've had a bunch of like almost positive, negative reinforcement, if you will, on that you're not very good at your job, quote unquote, or it's not going to be perfect. And you you feel like you have those, it's going to be really hard for you to get out of it. I want you to step out and actually hope. That's going to be the thing for you. That is the hard thing. The hoping. Yeah. I, yeah. Just the reframing and saying like, I am going to have a good outcome on this. Like saying that and believing it, I think, I think Mm -hmm. I can say it, but it's the believing it part where I'm like, Oh, just, this is like, this isn't true. Or I'm just saying that the, the believing it part is where I think I'm going to struggle. That's the core. You got to keep repeating it until you believe it. Mm-hmm. Honestly, that sounds so ridiculous, but that is the truth of the matter. We talk about, I feel like in, in my Christian walk um, mm-hmm. with friends, if you're not believing something like about God, just reference the scripture and repeat it over until you actually believe it. The same thing holds true for you here. Like repeat the thing until you believe it. And then here's the deal with belief. Once belief gets settled in, because you have a belief right now, whether you realize it or not, your belief right now is that you're not any good. So you need to purposefully rewire your brain to, and there's some neuroscience behind it that I'm not smart enough to understand. But if you reframe your belief to be that I am accomplished, I can do great things. I'm, you know, my past may tell me differently, but my future is still ahead of me. If you rewire your brain to start thinking like that in the positive your actual your 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 actions associated with that are going to have a downstream positive effect. So I see this all the time when people are switching jobs. They're like, I never get an offer. Nobody ever calls me in for an interview. And I'm like, then you're actually not going to do the work. You're not going to network. You're not going to do any of those things versus my clients who actually believe that a job is possible for them and the job that they want is possible for them. And they really enter into their like core belief system and that changes for them. Then they're the easy ones to get a job. It's like no big deal because all of their actions are now informed by that belief structure. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It really, it does. It does. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I can totally interpret that and apply it to like the job hunt process. It's like the job performance process is the the thing that I need to like transfer that to. 
Yeah. So tell me a little bit about, um, so we've covered a little bit about the imposter syndrome. What else do you want to cover on that or, or even just related to, um, rewiring your brain? Is there something else that you feel like Jenna, I'm still struggling with, or do we want to move on a little bit to talking about stuff with colleagues? We can talk about stuff with colleagues because I think that feeds into rewiring my brain a bit. I think that feels like a comfortable zone to like, um, if something goes wrong, like if I get negative feedback to Mm -hmm. disclose to a colleague or to maybe overshare. And I think it does a bit of like reputational damage or I end Mm -hmm. up sharing things before I feel totally safe to. Why do you think you do that? I think I feel like it's my way to connect with people. Um, and I'm like, oh, this is the only way I know how to connect with people is to kind of commiserate. Gotcha. Which is often common in the workplace for the record. <laughs> You're not <laughs> the only one. I've been a part of plenty of like groups and corporations and companies, big, small, and everything in between. It's common across the board. Um, when I was investment banking, it was like a privilege to complain. Like, cause that's all you had to work off of. Cause you're working like a hundred hours a week that in like getting your free food every, every night. Like that was the only thing there was really to connect on mm-hmm. because the lifestyle was so miserable. So I understand that sentiment. Here's my suggestion for you when thinking about once we can talk about one, like when you get feedback, how to react to that and how to process yeah. that really well. Um, but secondly, I want to, what I want to talk about first is talking to other colleagues about that kind of feedback. So I really made a point in my career to not mix business and personal. So other people have different opinions on that where they want to... And that's not to say that you don't show up as a whole person. I was just not friends with everybody in the office outside the office. I had Mm -hmm. one friend that I was really close with outside the office, probably in every single one of my positions and um, companies I was in. I had like one friend and that was the one friend that I felt safe enough to trust and to have those conversations with. So... I did not ascribe as much as possible to the commiserating because I think that gossip is the most toxic part about um, culture. It breaks down leadership. It breaks down teams. I think that gossip is one of the worst things that you can partake in. Do I understand that sometimes it happens? Yes, I've been guilty of it too. I might have a past colleague that's listening to it and being like, I remember that one time you said that. Like it totally could happen. What I would recommend though is like finding your one person that you feel like you can trust and only, and you kind of be in each other's, I call it my work wife. My, my work wife, Micah, was always my person at the Muse. Um, there was a woman that I worked with when I worked at the New York Stock Exchange that I was close with. Um, and then when I worked at Citibank, it was sunny. So like all these people, I can like pinpoint who my person was, but I really tried my best not to tell everybody. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, that does help. Yeah. yeah. Finding your one person and building that relationship up over time, I think allows you to have really rich friendships, first of all, which is really what we want, but then also not so much that you are exposing all of yourself to everybody at work. Cause I actually don't think that's very healthy either. No, no, it isn't. And then I, I don't want to realize that a lot of these like bonds, cause I actually have a lot of friends from past jobs and past like things that I've done, but I, I don't want to realize like, Oh, this is all just built on the fact that we've gossiped well, about a supervisor that we've both exactly. Exactly. And I think the other thing too is why I didn't ascribe to that is because, or why I didn't um, have all my friends be at work. Because when I worked at um, a couple of companies, like everybody was friends with everybody. And like, that was the way that they met new friends as an adult, which I think most of New York City (laughs) and most of young adult life is you meet your new friends post-college after work because, or rather in work, because that's the only like infrastructure you have to meet new people. Mm -hmm. For me, I made a very pointed effort to make friends outside of work. So I would join clubs. I was involved in my church and I was really looking for other opportunities to make friends because I hated the idea of only having my friends be at work because there's no escaping them. (laughs) Yeah. Or if you eventually leave, it's like you lose your entire friend structure. Yes. And then you're not included in the inside jokes. And it's just, I feel like it puts too much pressure on those relationships when yes, you should love going to work, but you don't need to be BFFs with everybody that you work with. Like there's a freedom to not do that. So that was kind of like, and I wonder if this is just like, maybe that was the wrong environment for me. The first job I ever worked at where I got let go, it was very much that kind of environment where everyone was kind of in their like mid, like early to mid to late Mm twenties. So it was like a bunch of children running around managing children in teams. Blind leading the blind. So many blurred lines, so much favoritism. It felt like even if I did do a good job at something that it would go totally unnoticed because like somebody else like got drinks with ex-supervisor the night Mm -hmm. before or something. Like it just felt like 
unnavigable for someone just plopped into that. And I've really tried to avoid those kinds of environments as mm-hmm. they go forward, where I just feel like it's like, oh, this is a bunch of children. I like, I really need a parent in the workplace. Yeah. So that leads me to my next question. Do you have a professional mentor? Um, not one distinct person. No, that's something that I do feel like I've craved. Like I've gone to uh, people that I respect or admire, whether that be like parents, friends, or or a past supervisor. And I've I've gotten coffee and asked questions, but I tend to feel like, oh, am I am I taking up this person's time and energy unnecessarily? Mm-hmm. Even though I would want to have them as a professional mentor. I don't know. I don't want to feel like I'm just taking up someone's time. Yeah. So I, I mean, gosh, that's that's like the million dollar question. I feel like, so how do you find a mentor? So for me, yeah. and I can share a little bit about how I've done that in my past. Um, one, I'm going to be transparent. I was set up basically on a, like a blind mentor date and she's awesome. And in the beginning, she was really um, given to me essentially by um, a past colleague's, colleague's wife's friend, basically is how that happened. She's like, I think you two would get along together. And we would go out for drinks and we would chat about work. But we'd also chat about life. And she was really much, much, much farther ahead of me in the sales region when I was starting down in sales. And um, she was just an awesome friend. And now it's funny, she's starting her own business. Business and we've swapped some stories and I've been a value to her. So I want you to think about mentorship is really is mutually beneficial because being mentoring somebody, um, you learn things about yourself as you're teaching somebody else. And then mentorship also is not just you giving. So if you're listening to this and you would like, you're thinking, wow, I would love to be a mentor to somebody one day, ask somebody if they want to be mentored. That's the first thing. It is scary for a mentee, like you're saying, to ask somebody, hey, will you be my mentor? The rejection feels way too high and you don't want to make someone feel uncomfortable. Right, so that's it. Just go out and ask the question, right? So if you are listening to this and you've been in your career 10 plus years and you feel like you could really mentor someone, think about somebody on your team that you can reach out to and say, hey, like we should grab coffee. You don't have to it's not like, it's not like when you're in high school, when you're like, will you be my boyfriend? And will you be my girlfriend? Like it's not, it doesn't have to be like that, <laughs> but it's more just like routinely getting together on a quarterly basis. And you don't have to tell them you're, you're they're your mentor. You just have to go to them for advice. That, that makes sense. I, and I get that. I think it's like mostly like fear of rejection, like fear of them being, yeah. you know, or I don't have time, which is valid. But yeah, um, I think, I just be like, oh, well, they don't think I'm good enough. Like that's probably mm, that needs to not be the narrative because it's never about you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's true. It is never about you. It's always about them. People don't think about you as much as you think about you. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that in the kindest way possible, right? Like that's not a negative thing. That's yeah. a positive thing. And so I think also when you're when you're thinking through mentorship, I really recommend finding someone internally and then externally. So when I worked at the Muse, I feel like I had a mentor internally. And then I also had a mentor externally so that I could go to about those political issues that I couldn't talk to maybe my boss about who I really did feel like was my mentor. Mm -hmm. And sometimes bosses can be mentors and sometimes they're not. Sometimes there's somebody else in a different department that could be your mentor. I know that for myself, when I worked at the New York Stock Exchange, um, I love the people in my group. And one of the, the, I talk about them all the time, but he was my leader at the New York Stock Exchange and he was an amazing leader. Um, I still talk to him all the time. He like commented on one of my Instagram posts the other day. He's hysterical. His daughters, you know, we're connected still. But while I was there, he was my mentor. But also there was somebody in a different department that I really looked up to that I would go to for advice on. And I would want to learn from her. And I think it was really just about not trying to just get something from somebody, but really just to have a conversation with someone. And I feel like when you rip, like leave leave that pressure, take that pressure off yourself, it, it gets a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. I think I tend to put a lot of like pressure on all of these interactions instead of just being myself. And yeah. I sometimes I've performed the best or when I've just, if the pressure hasn't been on myself or I haven't judged myself. Yeah. Why do you think that you default to judging yourself? Um, I wonder if it goes back like deeper than I know. I, I have really like high performing parents who are both uh, doctors and they really wanted me to go into medicine and I just, I chose not to, and I didn't have the aptitude for that kind of thing. And I wonder if I've always harbored a little bit of like, oh, I, I'll never outperform them or I, I didn't live up to those expectations. So let me tell you something, girl. 
that is some stuff you got to work through <laughs> for mm-hmm. sure. And I relate to that for sure. I feel like that for me ha- was very much a narrative. My parents were super go-getters. They sacrificed a lot for me to go to college. Yep. And I think at first, I don't want to say my parents think this now, but at first I think I was, I was disappointing them. I felt like I was disappointing them because I went and decided to leave finance and go and work for this really itty bitty company. <laughs> Right. So I, they sacrifice so much so I can have this finance degree and have this safe job when really I didn't want the safe job. It really, and finally I had to get to the point where I needed to decide if I was ready to take myself seriously or only just take the advice of my parents. Yeah. I think that's where I'm at too. That's exactly the junction that I'm at is that I feel like I, I chose not to do that. And it it wasn't just that I couldn't, I chose not to do that. And I, I chose to take jobs within public health instead. And I think I just need to own that. Um, even if it's not, you know, like on par with a medical degree. Yeah. And here's the thing, there is value in different capacities. Just Mm -hmm. because you're not a doctor doesn't mean that you're not providing value to the world. Yeah. You're uniquely designed. You're different than your parents. You are not your parents. Like my dad is really gifted in engineering and all things like inventing as so not my skill set. Like <laughs> I got none of those genes. Right. And so for me, I think really understanding that, um, I need to prioritize how I've been gifted and really lean into that. Otherwise I'm going to live an inauthentic life or I'm going to live a life that my parents want me to live. That not is not necessarily one I want to live. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some advice. My dad taught me and he was very gracious. He goes, you know, Jenna, at the end of the day, I'm not waking up to go to work for you. Your mom's not waking up to go to work for you. You're the only one that's waking up to go to work with you. So you need to remember that when you are feeling those emotions come up, because you've got a lot of things hitting you right now and you've yeah. got a lot of unlearning to do. Um, but I'm proud of you for like starting now because you're realizing I can't keep going like this. This is going to keep me stuck and I want to move forward and be the best version of myself I can possibly be. Yeah, that's exactly the point that I'm at. <laughs> good. I'm so glad. So let's talk about feedback. Um, and I think that'll kind of get us to our good good stopping point for us. So tell me what happens to you when you receive feedback. Um, if it's good feedback, I feel like my whole day is made and I'm like, woohoo, like I'm crushing it and everything is perfect and this is great and it's it feels great. When it's bad feedback, um, I do let it like, I, I think... I internalize it and let it tumble into other things. And it makes me afraid and it makes me afraid as I tackle other tasks. And I feel like I bring that energy into other things and I want to learn how to be receptive to it and to not just carry it around and then be afraid of the other things that I have on my plate. Like I screwed that up. So I'm going to screw the next five things up too. So I wonder what would happen if you gave yourself 24 hours. So what I mean by this is I give myself the 24 hour rule. So I'm allowed to be miserable for 24 hours. <laughs> if I'm upset yeah. by maybe somebody hating on me on LinkedIn, which happens, I've had somebody who reached out to me and said, I like give myself the time to be angry because mm-hmm. if you don't, if you don't allow your, yourself the time to be frustrated, it's going to come out sideways somewhere else. Right. And so you have to allow yourself the opportunity to be frustrated and feel down because it's a natural human emotion. We cannot be robots. The robots have not taken over work yet. (laughs) So so I think for you, it really looks like allowing yourself to feel those emotions and then saying, okay, what have I learned from this? Going back to that original question about failure. And then how can I actually move myself forward to create an action plan to learn from this mistake and keep moving? Because here's the reality is throughout your career, you're going to have negative feedback more so, as you mentioned, than positive feedback, just because if people have the option to edit something, they will. If people Mm -hmm. have the option to give advice, they will. (laughs) And you cannot let that define you. You have to really listen to an inner gut instinct about what is appropriate for you and what is true of you and what's not. If you let too many people speak into who you are, you're going to let them run over you and like bulldoze you into believing exactly what they think, which isn't always true. So I just want to remind you that you are you, you're unique. You have your own skill sets. You have things that you have been capable of doing in the past. Don't let people who give you feedback well-intentioned to let that destroy your week because it's not going to serve you. It's only going to harm you. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. So the 24 hour rule is like, you got to let it go within 24 hours and you got to move forward. And you got to, and as soon as you feel yourself, like you, I think the biggest thing for you is being self-aware and noticing when those thoughts are coming up. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I, I think not letting them define me either or not letting people mm. people's input define me is something that I really need to work on. And I think it just comes from like knowing yourself. And maybe I'm just at the beginning stages of figuring that out. Because I'm yeah. still accumulating data. Like I still, I've only worked four jobs and I'm still figuring out what I'm good at and what I'm not. Yeah. And like that takes time. You're supposed to. That's what your whole first half of your career is, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> and your second half is really about refining and um, kind of doubling down and becoming the expert. So I would recommend with those work wins and the failure is like, that's going to help you really define who you are. Mm -hmm. That's going to help you understand that a little bit better. What are some other things you feel like you're struggling with right now at work? Do you feel like we've covered them all? Those are really, those are really the main ones. Um, I mean, I'm starting this new job, uh, next week, which I feel lucky during this crazy time to be starting. It's amazing. Yeah. This is really a chaotic time for a lot of people. So I definitely feel blessed, but I am nervous about my old demons rearing their heads and about not getting off. Like I want to get off to a great foot because I feel like that would make me feel validated. So if things do go a bit rocky in the beginning, like I want to know how I can like, you know, move forward effectively. I think the biggest thing to remember is it's going to be rocky the first three months. Every new job, even if you're in the same company, different position is rocky the first three months. So if it's happening, great, you're learning. Um, You're not going to have it perfect. So allow yourself that grace. And then I think the other piece to the puzzle is you just have to be super, super aware of when those demons are coming out. It's going to be something that you have to continually work on and continually journal through. Honestly, I think the journaling is going to be really impactful because if you have those proof points of things that you really did well, it's going to help you understand and remind you of who you are. I think I've told this story before, but I was in this um, Bible study group that I, with women and they got to know me over 10 weeks. And at the end of that conversation, at end of that kind of time together, they, we all got a sheet of paper that the other women wrote something, a word about us, like that they thought they admired about us. And so I have this whole list of words that other people have said positively about me. And I refer to that. I have it up in my fridge. So I do not forget who I am when I have bad days because we all have them. Mm -hmm. So I just want to encourage you that you are not alone in this. This is a normal struggle. I'm so proud of you for taking it to the next level and really trying to to dive into what the imposter syndrome is and just being honest and brave because I feel like so many people are going to learn from this conversation. But I would love to hear from you kind of as we wrap this up. What do you feel is your biggest takeaway from this conversation? Honestly, just knowing that I'm not alone in this. There's, There's a bunch of people that are probably struggling with what I'm struggling with, even if they don't talk about it. And that I need to take stock of some of the positives in my life. Um, In work, I think the writing down three wins and um, also a failure and reframing a failure as a positive. And um, my mom says something where it's like, if it comes easy, then like, like nothing that comes easy is really worth it. Like, I think all the things that really are worth it are the things that are hard. So if it feels hard right now, it's probably a good thing that, that like there's some positive growth that's happening from that. Yeah. I love it. You have been such a joy to coach. Thank you guys for listening. Um, I would love it to get connected with you if you're listening via LinkedIn. And then also if you are ever interested in an on-air coaching call like this, I'm happy to provide. Um, these are super fun for me and I've really enjoyed getting to know you more and sharing more of your story. Thank you so much. Hey y'all, thanks so much for listening to Your Career Story Podcast. I would love, 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 love to get to meet you. And there are a couple of ways that we can connect in between episodes. First and foremost, you know I love my LinkedIn. Second is via Instagram. And third is over on my website. I actually have a special spot just for you full of fun, free resources. So all you have to do is go to www.jennaviviano.com backslash resources. Super simple for a bunch of freebies that will help you boost your career. Hope to see you next week.